Well, I want to welcome everybody to the March 2024 meeting of Portland Photographers Forum. Um, tonight is members night, so we have three members who will speak for 30 minutes each. Uh, tonight we have Gary Kanazi, Nick Caruli, and Walter Oliver. Uh, but we'll start with a few announcements and then we'll have the uh, the slideshow from the photo challenge for this month. Um, so uh, the, the first announcement is that the uh, the photography gallery show at OSA uh, is going to happen in April, and it's uh, the deadline is March 21st to submit your two images. Uh, this year, the theme was visual poetry, looking for the meaning, and our juror is Fritz Lidke, who uh, talked to PPF last month. And the opening reception will be on April 4th, and you can find all the information on the OSA website. Um, uh, I'd like to re remind you about that. Uh -huh. um, uh, so on the prospectus, it or somewhere in there, it says, uh, well, I guess because some people have other kinds of art, uh, they have to take a picture of it, but it's okay to to do the usual thing when we submit, right? Just make a digital file. Oh yeah, yeah. Th that that the uh, terminology is mostly for like uh, watercolor artists, other and, media, uh, right? Other media, yeah. So we can just submit the the photographic files in the usual uh, like way. Okay. In the usual way. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. Any other questions about that? Yeah, Robert. Yeah. Uh, I've been trying for days to upload my two photos, with no luck whatsoever. And uh, I've also called and with no return to my calls. So uh, you have you heard anything about a glitch in the Google upload thing? Oh, uh, I know I had used it, used it okay. Uh, I would say, yeah, call the office again. There's usually somebody there because they have to take all those uh, calls to take people's credit card information. Uh, to yeah, sign Johanna, people. I called and uh that did, did you call first to to give your payment yeah uh, i was successful doing that and then when i i did the call made the payment then filled in everything on that form and then when it goes to says upload or drag your image that's where the glitch is i can't get right. it to work I've, I've worked on it for about a week actually yeah and she i can't said, get phone, uh... no answer to my phone messages either the gal I talked to said to just shoot her an email and it's just the uh the info uh, yeah if you just sent but just put them in an email and and send it to info at OS artists I believe uh, is what Johanna. it is Johanna something yeah. I sometimes the drag and drop does not work on my computer so what yeah. I do is I just copy the image uh -huh. and insert it that way so you might try that but sometimes I'll try yeah I'll try copying Otherwise, I'll send it to them in an email. Okay, thanks. Thanks for all those tips. Okay. Um, so it is 2024, and I want to remind everyone who hasn't renewed their membership yet that it's now time to renew your membership for this year. And thank you to everyone who has already renewed. Um, and I want to also welcome, We I think we have 15 or more new members this year, so I want to welcome all the new members. Um, I want to give an update about the print share meetings. So our print share meetings are on the held on the first Monday of each month at the Multnomah Art Center. And Ray Bidigan is stepping down as host of the print share meetings. Uh, last month was his was his uh, last hurrah. So he will uh, we will be turning it over to Doug Rundle and and Walt Duddington have uh, offered to uh, share the hosting duties for the rest of this year. Uh, so thanks to Doug and Walt for uh, stepping up and helping us out with that. And both both Doug and Walt are past presidents of PPF, so they're experienced hands and they uh, attend almost all of the print share meetings, so they they know the routine. <laughs> um, so uh, Mark Danley, did you want to make an announcement about your gallery show? Yeah, sure. I'm Mark Danley, and together with another photographer, Ellen Graham, I have a, a basically a, a two-person show at Gallery 114 in the Pearl. It's right across from Blick on Gleason. 
And the theme of the of the show is called City Works Portland, which what we've done is visited some small craft manufacturers and so forth and taking and taking pictures of people doing making these crafts and and it's actually quite fun and part of the reason we did that was to start changing the narrative that that Portland is just a city that's you know in decay what we what we really found is there's some really wonderful people making great stuff every day and it was just great to interact with them and I think the the show is is quite interesting so and Pat came to the um, art talk I did yesterday or we did yesterday so she may speak to that. It's, it's actually kind of nice. Um, uh, the gallery is open from Thursday through Sunday, noon to five. The last day the show is going to be up is on the 30th. If anybody can't make those regular times, I'm more than happy if you send me an email to open it up if I'm available. You know, I've got a key so I can get in there. So anyway, come on down and take a look. Yeah, the uh, I'll just chime in a little bit. I went to the talk yesterday, which was so refreshing. Um, the, these, the usual drill on an artist talk is the artist to stand there and give a, you know, a presentation, which is fine. But this was a little different. So they opened it up right away to the audience. And so it's like being in a, a living room talking with some friends. And it was just such a nice way to, to uh, you know, interact with uh, the artists with the audience and vice versa to kind of to read each other's um, you know impressions and motivations for making the work that sort of thing so I really appreciate it it was it was a lot of fun and that's a great exhibit um, and uh, I hope uh, trying to talk Mark into submitting that project to the airport because I think this would be just a perfect uh, topic perfect project uh, to for out of towners to get a good eye, uh, you know, a glimpse of the positive side of Portland, not all this bad news that we keep hearing about these days, riots in the streets and uh, fentanyl use and what have you. So uh, anyway, compliments, Mark. Well, yeah, thanks, thank Pat. You. I, uh, opening up to the audience means I don't really have to say much. I can just sit there and let everybody else talk, but I, <laughs> Um, we've actually already submitted to the uh, to the airport. Um, oh, my co my co author, if you will, uh, does that kind of stuff. So she's already submitted that. So we'll see if the airport picks it up. But stay tuned. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks, Mark, and thanks, Pat. Uh, Joe Whittington, did you want to make a couple of announcements? Yeah. I uh, much to my surprise, um, I have a photo that's going to be in the white box photographic gallery for their sonocracy i think something like that show um anyway it uh, of course it's not in portland so it requires some transporting so they have to be there by april 6th i think the reception is on april 13th so if anyone else has anything in that show um <laughs> send me an email or something and maybe we can coordinate uh some Joe, people. I do too. Oh, okay, Martha, it looks like you need to unmute. Yeah, you're muted. Okay. Yeah. Joe, I have something in that show too. Maybe we can um, figure out some transport because I don't want to mail it. Yeah, I don't want to do that either. I mailed something to them a couple of months ago when I had a show, a, a picture in their show, and it was just a horror show. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, anyway, so it's Joe Whittington at gmail.com. It's on the website. So uh, send me an email and we can great. Get... One of us can drop, the other one can pick up. Yeah, I think that might work out well. Neat. Okay. Cool. Uh, one other thing, I, I drove past the uh, the cherry trees at the uh, the Japanese Memorial Garden down on Waterfront Park, and they have exploded. They are in full total bloom. So um, if anyone's interested, I'm uh, I'm going to go down tomorrow before it starts raining. Sunrise is at 7.15. So I think I'll probably at least, um, I'm not real efficient in the morning, but try to get there maybe a quarter to seven. There's usually a few parking spots early right there at Everett and uh, and NATO Parkways, but, but they're there 
they're right at peak now if anyone wants to do the cherry blossom things down there. It's very, very cool. And if you haven't been down there, the um, the Japanese memorial exhibit is uh, quite moving, actually. Good. Thank, thanks, Joe. Um, <clears throat> let's let's move on then and we'll see the slideshow from the uh, from this month's photo challenge. So uh, in February, uh, I think 17 people went on the trip to Salem to the Brothers Car Museum, and uh, we asked them to submit their photos uh, of the outing, and we made that the, uh, the slideshow for this month. So let me get that up here. And hopefully there's sound. There's supposed to be sound, but there always there isn't always. And the slideshow takes ten minutes and fifteen seconds. Oh shit. Did anybody hear any sound? No sound. No. Okay. No sound. I think we got the sound now. So let's try it again.
Thanks everyone who submitted pictures. Uh, it looked like a really fun outing. Um, for next month, I think we will ask everybody who submitted photos to the OSA gallery show to send in the two that they submitted. And if you didn't submit something, you could send two that are on the same theme of visual poetry. Um, so with that, uh, we'll start our, our with our featured speakers. Uh, tonight, we have three members uh, speaking for 30 minutes each, and uh, tonight's program is a little unusual because Nick and Gary are kind of going to go together, but they're going to alternate. So Nick uh, Karuli and Gary Kanazi have been friends for more than 40 years and have been taking photos on outings together for the past 40 years, and our regulars at the Monday night print share meetings and always have... Uh, beautiful, beautiful images. So uh, uh, Nick, if you uh, would want to unmute and uh, and if you want to hit your screen share. Can you hear us? Can yes. you hear us? Okay. okay. okay here goes. Well, we'll wait on screen share for a second. We, can wait. we don't need it oh. right now. We'll just talk a little bit before I hit the screen share probably. Good. But um, yeah, so just a little background. Uh, Nick and I were both working in retail at Jansen Beach Center all those years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. He worked at Sandy's Camera Store. And can you hear me okay? Good. Okay. And then I was working at a little hobby shop down the way. And that's just kind of how we met, just kind of, um, you know, meeting each other. I went to the camera store. We talked a little bit and everything. And, uh, you know, find out we had similar interests as far as subject matter and that. 
And so uh, basically we just kind of did a photo trip. Our first trip was like to Goldendale, Washington. Um, and we all, we both had four, 35 millimeter cameras. And uh, the one thing that really opened my eyes and probably Nick's too, to, uh, to really what four by five was, uh, cause we both were just, you know, admired Ansel Adams, read his books and all that stuff. But Nick brought into me one day cause he had a four by five, just a really old one with a really old lens, but he had this picture of two ducks he showed me. Uh, was it the ducks first you showed me? Yeah, I went yeah. to the park at Silver Lake or not Silver uh, Lake. It was Rhododendron Guard. Oh, okay. And I took my four by five. I really didn't know how to use it. So I loaded it up with film and was hand holding it and took a picture of a mallard duck and another duck next to it. Yeah. And then I took that negative and developed it and then decided that I would um, enlarge one section of it. So I enlarged it. So all you could see was the eye of the duck. And you could actually see me holding the camera in the eye of the duck. Yeah. And then I went to him and I said, hey, look at how nice four by five looks. And I showed him the picture of the two ducks and he's looking at it going, oh, yeah, that looks like great tones. That's really good. And I said, well, <laughs> here's what you can do when you enlarge it. And I showed him that. I thought he was going to die because yeah, it was an eight by ten. It was an eight by ten of just the eye. The eye with so, him reflecting in it. Yeah. So it was kind of like, oh, wow, I think we need to go into four by five. Yeah. You know, so that's that's kind of where that started. And then we just we shot for quite a few years with four by five. And I'll show you we'll show you some of the testing little brief things we did with it. But uh, and then eventually we moved into Hasselblad because it was uh, more portable and had a little more variety. And then we started that's when we started shooting a little more in color at that point, color negative. Uh, and at that point, we both got Imacon scanners. He got a four by five one. I got a smaller two and a quarter Imacon so we could scan because we, we were we knew digital was the way to you know the future so we got into it pretty early on as early as we could um with that and uh but the whole the whole cool thing about our relationship all those years is that even back then we, we just have so many similar tastes you know in music in food and and obviously subject matter um and i mean one of the one of the neatest things is that how in, in all these years we've taken you know tens of thousands of pictures together probably 90 percent of the pictures we've ever taken have been taken together you know one with the other and what's so cool about that uh, is that, you know, we can be standing in the same place and get come up with totally different images. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I'll look at some of his and just really hate him for the picture he got <laughs> that I didn't get. And yeah. maybe vice versa, but, but it usually very, hides the best ones. For me. <laughs> yeah, I'm, so I'm hiding <laughs> yeah, with a big cloth, but which you could do a lot easier with yeah. four by five. But, look over here. Look <laughs> yeah, here. look at that. <laughs> no, but it's really, it's really neat to see what we come away with because I'm always, I'm always uh, admire so much what I see Nick's versions of pictures that were like either closer up or farther away. It's like, oh, I didn't think about cropping in or maybe shooting wider. So, and part of the the yeah. best part of having a friend to go out and take pictures with is it's someone you can bounce things off yeah. of, yeah. and you know you yeah. can learn together. I mean, early on, we really got into the reading of Ansel Adams' book, and we'll show you some pictures of the test shots we used to do and mm -hmm. developing the negative and mm -hmm. since i was a physician i had access to a uh, x-ray dark room with a densitometer so yeah. i could actually read the densities on each of these little things it's amazing how much work we actually did <laughs> yeah. but it was so confusing back then you know how to how to really get a nice picture that had uh, a great symphony of tones in it um which is what we've always strived for he plays music i I don't, that's one of our main differences. And, you know, our wives are always uh, giving us a bad time because we spend so much time out taking pictures together, <laughs> but they're probably glad we're out, so. It's like fishermen. <laughs> yeah, like it's fishermen. like fishing, we're fishing we're the camera. Out. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, uh, it's, yeah it's, just, it's just really neat. So, you know, if you could ever connect in with some other photographer with similar, just, it's worth trying, you know, because you never know, but it does, it really is neat to be able to bounce things off of each other and just mm -hmm. kind of, you know, just just go. Hey, is this looking good? Am I doing something wrong mm -hmm. here? And it's it's just nice to have somebody who you know will be honest with their their thoughts and everything, and you, and you can do that. Should so I share the screen now. Yeah, go ahead, share the screen. Yeah. Okay, let's see if this works. Right there, just click that one. Double click it. Hopefully, I think right. We have to cheer. Oh, hang on, just a second. There, does it cheer? There we go. There so see, okay, can, we got it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. We you see can see how far back we go. So this is only a couple of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> this is when we time traveled. No. Yeah, no, it's quite a while. Yeah. Ago. No, that's that's one of the uh, 
Yeah, we were at yeah, obviously one of those camera, I don't know, wherever they do that. But Jansen was, Beach. Oh, that was Jansen Beach. Yeah. That's right. Yep. Oh, how do we do next? We got these guys in the way. I think I can hit this. Oh, do the next. Yeah. So there's me from some years ago with a four by five out there taking a picture of a needle building, which is now gone. That burnt to the ground a couple of years yeah, ago. A lot of the old buildings are gone. Yeah. This is Nick. He's a little more shy. <laughs> I shot that. I didn't want anybody to know where I am, but <laughs> that's up by Mount Rainier. Yeah, I shot that up. So here's the yeah, go ahead. One these one. are our these are the Bibles that we sort of use, yeah. especially the negative that really uh taught us a lot and yeah. admiring Ansel's work. And um, and this and this is the thing you gotta remember, there was no internet back then that was of any use. Like you have YouTubes and that, and you know, magazines sometimes, but boy, the the stuff that was in magazines was pretty useless. It, it was very misleading a lot of it. Mm -hmm. So and none of them covered the stuff that Ansel did. So that was our standard for you know learning. What we wanted to learn and here's some of the different we won't bore you with them but the yeah. different development times and agitating it and yeah. you know different temperatures in hc 110 just to get the tones that we wanted to get and yeah. then we'd read these on a densitometer and we'd get a curve so we could actually yeah. see the different tones now this is multi-grade papers from i think five to down to one half mm -hmm. so we would have these test strips so we could see what you know what each one was going to give us tonality wise in there so yeah, so there's a lot of technical stuff in the background. Like, it, we won't bore you too much with it, but and that's another. So that one, actually go back. That one you can go back. So this one is actually off the digital printer now. This is now that we've moved into. Obviously, you can see the date there. I just I printed that. Well, I printed these through the years, but since I've had my printer, but it tells you tells you what it is. That's a pro. But it's there's 255 tones there is what it's saying. Yeah. So again, much easier to get to now that you're digital <laughs> than mm -hmm. film but, than before. Yeah. And that's just, just a, color. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. This, this was, was very interesting. This was one of my original um, actual digital photographs that I took. And I had an Epson printer that's a 40 by 60 print. Um, and I just did this with this is a 12 megapixel image shot way back when. Way back. Um, Photoshop. I don't even think Lightroom was around then. It was just Photoshop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, just Photoshop. it's it's amazing the detail that you could get from digital. And this was one of the things that sort of made us switch from um, being in uh, film to this. But this is actually just looking at the print. But you can see the detail of that. Um, it doesn't do it justice. And that's just, it it's just amazing what, what it could do. And this so. is, yeah, I remember this is the old... Photoshop, 20 year old Photoshop or Rockland, you're right, right in that range that resed it up by just going up 10%, 10%, 10%. So it was yeah. a very archaic, the old way of doing it. And it, if you see, could see that actual print, it is amazingly sharp. Every strand of hair, it, it just blew me away when I saw that. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so here's mine and then we'll, we'll show you Nick's pictures. So, how'd you do that? Oh, just to, yeah, just hit the next. So, I'm going to start out some of the, that's a four by five image. Of course, I, we were scanning pretty much once we got out of the dark room, which was when, how many years ago was it? We got out of the dark room quite a while ago. Yeah, I think 92 or 93 is when we yeah. started doing digital. Yeah, we were starting to get into the digital light. I actually had a printer, um, Epson printer. I got the um, monotonings for it to try out, which you just basically different shades of gray for every, for like the four cartridges, I think it was. And it did okay. I mean, it was a, you know, it was early on and it, it did good, but we were scanning our images as early as we could to, uh, to you know just get that digital image to start working with it because it, it offered a lot the key was it offered a ton more control because in the digital if you, you guys to print the dark and you know you know to, to reproduce an image over and over again you take you know meticulous notes true but you know to move your hand over this spot for that long and that spot in this it's always hard to get it exactly right and you got to go through the whole process of developing the print all the way to the end to see, okay, and now it's dry. Now I can see how it printed out. You know, gee, I need to burn more here, dodge there. So it's a much more time consuming process for, you know, the mm -hmm. digital just gives you so much instant, which is nice when you have a fair amount of images. But anyway, this is four by five. And this is my series I started doing in four by five of the schoolhouses along the Oregon Trail, which got me into a, the newspaper saw them and got published and we got them into a University of Eugene. They bought a whole bunch of these for their boardroom but it was that which, which was very flattering but again four by five this one i remember setting up the camera and i saw that cloud moving from left to right and going like oh that'd be so neat and it was moving quickly so uh, i wanted to get it right where it's at over the chimney i shot it once 
turned it over the film, got another shot about probably five seconds later, and it didn't look quite the same. So anyway, just it's you know it's it's so much slower with four by five, but I mean really beautiful tones. But I'll tell you, even with the best process negative, these were very difficult to not so much scan, but just to to pull them out as you can. Digital cameras mm -hmm. just do it so much better, so much easier. Again, another four by five. Uh, these are early years ago. And this was taken with a two and a quarter <clears throat> with a TLR, Twin Lens Reflex Mamiya, I think it was. And again, this is this is the thing in film. You can't see what you're getting. So I knew what I wanted, which was exactly a shot like this with the kind of the ghost pages, I call them. <clears throat> but, you know, you sh I had a roll of 12 images and shot 12. And this is the best one out of them. But, you know, that's the thing with film. So you, you just can't see what you get now. So it's a big advantage. Another two and a quarter when we went to France um another two and a quarter yeah and th these are all case all shot in color negative film because you can pull the tones out better with with color there's a full-on color one so uh again scanned with a nimicon and then <coughs> the key the downside of of, of um scans were the the dust because there's these are high-res scans so when you scan them on an nimicon instead of a drum scanner you get um thanks you get um a lot more dust so it's about an hour worth of dusting before you start working on the image so uh, but drum scan if you got a negative that's the best way to go <clears throat> oh and this one i'm going to show you so this is a black this is a, one of my not yeah it goes back quite a few years for digital digital um 35 format canon 5d i think or something like that so this is the finished image here's the raw image so that just gives you an idea of and this is no processing this is just what the camera gave me um, and then, you know, we moved it. That's, that's what you can do with it. So, so before and after, and you can do a lot with black and white too. Um, okay. So now this is a little later on. Now I'm shooting full digital, pretty much around 20, 21 megapixel cameras, my whole career through there. That's I, my current Canon's an R3 and it's 24 megapixel, which is sufficient for me. I don't need because I work a lot of times with layers and that. This was an interesting picture because I'd actually shot this with four by five. And it was, I came back, <laughs> wow, 20 years later. And this, I shot the same area, same place. And it's amazing how much it, it emulates the four by five image. So I was happy with that. <clears throat> Again, just four by five. I mean, these are two, I'm sorry. Uh, Canon, Canon R5. No, not R5. What is it? That was a Canon. All right. No, this was probably 5D. the 5D. Yeah. yeah. So just trying to get some different perspectives here when <clears throat> out and about. And this is the <clears throat> this is the whole freedom of getting away from it. In most cases, we still use tripods, but not having to be locked in on a four by five or a two and a quarter is that you have tremendous freedom to, especially with image stabilized lenses and cameras. To be able to move around quickly and freely and set your compositions up, so uh, <laughs> they kind of have a love hate with tripods. You know, <laughs> there's just times you can't avoid them. Um, so there's one there. This one is this is actually <clears throat> up towards Hillsborough. Right? I don't know if it's still there, but many years ago, I just thought it was so intriguing that it was really listing off like that. And that you know, it's always nice when you come across a subject <clears throat> where you've got everything works together. You got a beautiful tree on the left good tree on the right you know sometimes you come across a subject and it's like oh it's good but you know there's a point where you could go yeah i can retouch that but sometimes it's, it's not worth the work <laughs> so it was that same church i showed earlier and this is this is up somewhere in battleground i think i took that and this is a cool one this is nick and i run a trip uh in oregon somewhere right I say near Mount, maybe Hood River area or something. Just drove along a road and <clears throat> found this listing <laughs> barn, which was so crazy cool. And I think that's, is that, is that? That's Adams, I think. That's Adams, I think, yeah, to the north. Yeah. This was, this was so cool. This one I was with my wife driving back at this amazing sky from Salem. We're driving from Salem to Portland. And I said, oh my gosh, that sky is to die for. But it's nothing without a subject and like we drove like five miles and bam that that was there he's like yes thank you lord we'll take it and these were just a 
one of the old houses we go into, which, you know, we always try and be respectful of people's places. We make sure there's no trespassing signs and we'll ask as much as we can. Uh, this one we checked everywhere we could. There was no one to ask. It was out of, no, out of nowhere, but these two sweaters are just left there, which I thought was really neat. This one I liked because it was just kind of that Eastern Oregon or Eastern Washington kind of feel to it. I just, the light was, this is what we see a lot when we go, you know, to the East. So I just thought that was just a neat, neat uh, image. And this one was just uh, the right place, right time. <laughs> You know, that was just amazing seeing that silhouetted kind of farm. And then the rainbow was just, yeah, the bonus. So I would have taken it without that, but that's a nice little plus. This is just, uh, it's over in Portland. I think that was that glass place mm -hmm. off of interstate. I don't know if it's much there anymore, but just had fun playing with that one and adding some tonality to it. And this is in Portland somewhere too, <laughs> but I'm not sure. Again, just you know, just working with the tones and playing around with it. So I'm doing trying to do more color. I did so much black and right black in the day. Uh, so I started working more with the color. This this I initially did in black and white, and then wanted to put it into color. So which it looks you know good to me too. So again, just you know, it's always right place, right time, and of course, right lighting. But uh, like I said before, landscape photography it can change quickly on you. A lot of people like this shot because of the old and the new farms, the you know, wind farms, so to speak. So this one I, I really like because it felt very like uh, aliens taking over, coming in, you know. <laughs> That's the nice shot that I that this is what it feels like to me. So they're just, they're just interesting subjects, you know. I'm not a big fan of them in some ways because they cost us so much as taxpayers, but. These were great because these, I just love the, there's no, there's no black or gray ones out there. It was just the way the shadows was hitting all three of those at the same time, which was, I didn't know that until later. <laughs> really liked the sky and it was very kind of that mid-century look with the sky. I thought it was very cool. So I, you get lucky, you know, you get lucky. There's one at sunset. So let's see what else we got. Now that, oh, that was, yeah, it's still, it's still digital, yeah. At the coast, some coastal shots. <clears throat> this one here. That was where was that was south of here. That was mm -hmm. way down there, wasn't it? That was almost to California, I think. That little area. And this was this is one I actually did two shots of. I did one for the foreground and the shadow area of the rock, and then I did one for the background and just blended those to just two shots. So. One of the few times I've done that, I like that though. Just a different angle, you know, mix it up a little, make those clouds kind of catch that lighthouse. <laughs> this is, um, this is Thor as well. Thor as well. Thank you. Yes. That was a neat place. So many years. We just took this this last year and it was like so many years we've been seeing this place and finally went down there and got some shots of it. Very challenging to get that water at the right time to flow just like it does. It moves very quickly. I was surprised. And this is Shore Acres. But, uh, it was, uh, I don't know, if, I don't think it was King Tide. I think it was just a stormy day. Uh, I mean, I've seen bigger waves down there, but I was really happy to capture that. And again, the rainbow, very lucky. It lasted about 20 seconds and it was gone. And this is um, just a Cape Disappointment during, I think that was, King Tides. Mm -hmm. King Tides, a little storminess, yeah. Added a lot of plus to that, so that was that was really neat. Boy, 200 plus photographers to our right. We were at the bar <laughs> left, left, and it was just, in, I couldn't believe, I've never seen that many photographers together. We just literally, like, two, easily 200, maybe more. Cool. Come up with your own caption on that. This tree was actually over by Costco where I live, but it was so cool because it, 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 had, it had frosted over and it just, that's what they're, I think a 300 millimeter lens. So just, just looked neat. So I liked it. Yeah, that was one Nick and I got, that's, those two are, he's got one that's very similar. So I think we, at this point we shot that very similar because it wasn't, there wasn't, wasn't a lot of leeway which way you shoot left or right on that. You gotta be lined up just right. And this is um, somewhere in Washington, North Coast, I know that. 
And this was very cool. We saw this from the road. There was a cemetery. It just says, I'm actually standing at the back of the cemetery. But we saw this the sky doing this lighting, which I've never seen quite like that before, and made a beeline for it and, and got out and took some quick pictures. But actually, this has had very, very little change to it. It's almost just how it looked, very little change from the original. And that's in Louisville Park, actually. I took that. Kind of reminded me of falling leaves, even though they're on a tree. <laughs> just had a neat look to it. Redwood Forest, we went to a couple years ago. Yeah, so that was that was a plus. Again, right place, right time, you know. It makes a big difference. So one of my um, attempts for the long exposure with these pools, I, I really like how this turned out. Yeah. Uh, Washington State somewhere. Rainier. Is that where it's at? Yeah. Again, good, beautiful lighting coming over the top from the back, just, you know, just making things glisten a little bit. That's over in Washington. Again, another, hey, there's a rainbow. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> that happens. Very nice. I like the light there. That's right here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Funny, I shot this in two and a quarter and actually finished the image off. And then I shot it later, some like probably four years ago, three years ago, maybe in digital. And I like this one better because I can do more with the image. It's, it's working with the color negative to print. It looks good, but it doesn't look as good as this. It's just the tonality is not as good. And that's when we took a couple of years or so ago, probably. Yeah. Waterfall. That's Lewis River. Uh, this is recently, yes, down the gorge. Uh, is it Horsetail? Is that what that is? Um, yep. Yeah. And then, uh, what is going on there? Why is it? And then, oh, this is, yeah, this was quite a beautiful drive. This is one little drive we took. Uh, where were we? We were going into Washington. Mm -hmm. What was that? We followed a river anyways. This, the light was beautiful, no wind, great fall colors. This is the same trip. And it's, it's magical when you get all that happening. The light is just killer good. It's, you just can't beat it. You know, it's just, uh, yeah, this is, I just love the colors of the reflection and the, the flowers reflecting across the pond there. Down the gorge. Again, right place, right time. Big piece of it. And there's Nick's. So I'll let Nick talk about this. So Gary, would you want to take a few oh, yeah. questions? Yes, before absolutely. Nick starts? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Let's take questions, sure. You seem to say that you um, came upon something. Mm -hmm. uh, what you're capturing I, I, I'm, I'm I'm speechless. They're gorgeous. Oh, thank, you. thank you. And I wonder how honest you are about pulling over the car, jumping out, and taking a shot. Now, yeah. uh, fess up. Come on, tell us the truth. No, how you know what the funny thing is? Here, here's the funny thing, Nick. <laughs> gosh, forever, <laughs> forever. This is so funny. And as we, I'll tell you. So forever, we've been. The joke is, we don't get more than twenty feet off the road because we're lazy, I guess. <laughs> Here, the funny thing is, as we've gotten older, we've been going farther off the road, quite a bit farther, a lot more difficult heights, mm -hmm. like hikes, and it's like, what are we thinking? Why didn't we do this when we were younger? Just getting into doing more waterfalls. There's so many waterfalls and everything, but but yeah, no, actually most of everything you've seen, let me think, uh, yeah, we're shot pretty much not far from the car. Mm -hmm. The large majority, right? I would think yeah. so, yeah. One yeah. of the interesting things, it's we're kind of like hunters when we go out yeah. we'll travel a long way mm -hmm. and we ansel used to wait for the light yeah he would find a place and then go back until the light was perfect mm -hmm. and then take the photograph we went the other approach we drove <laughs> we'd wait a few minutes and then if the light isn't there we just go on and see what we could find yeah. farther on so yeah, yeah these images are pretty quick um yeah most of the time i i Personally, I don't wait for a lot of images. I mean, mm -hmm. I will if there's a couple of the rainbows where you could see the rainbow coming. So yeah. you obviously wait. Yeah. Um, one time we went to Shrikers. I may have the picture in my set that comes up. Oh, that was um, amazing. Yeah. It was a really stormy day. Yeah. Um, actually, the picture that he shot of the big wave with the rainbow in it. Um, uh, we were taking pictures and then all of a sudden 
all the light went away and it just this rainstorm oh, came. It's so terrible. Yeah. We both ran back to the car. Yeah. Cameras are all wet. And I said, okay, let's go somewhere else because this doesn't look like it's going to go away. And then mm. no more than five minutes later, yeah. the light was just magical again. So we got yeah. out of the car and <laughs> ran out and got the rest of those pictures. Yeah. A year later, we were down there and I swear <laughs> the exact same thing happened. Same the scenario. light was the same. Everything looked the same. Yep. Got out of the car got these amazing pictures the rain was all over the lens i said come on i'm the one who doesn't like to get wet and i, I want to leave quickly so i'm like yeah. let's go back to the car this happened before and he's like well remember what happened last year and i said that is not going to happen again <laughs> forget it yeah and then i'm wiping yeah. my lens off and i look up and it cleared again it and we did. jump out of the car and run back down and take the picture. same so, time frame yeah like five mm -hmm. or ten minutes and it just boom but yeah no and neither one of us are that patient i guess but yeah we, there's times when we you know, you know, you can kind of wait it out or, or like if you're somewhere where things are changing a lot, like moving water, mm -hmm. well, you can shoot, you know, probably at, at about a 10 minute span. You'll see different move, movements of water. And then, you know, you don't want to end up too, with too many images you have to go through. So, And, and another thing we but, talk about a lot when we're on trips, we have a lot of time to talk. And it's basically if we pull up somewhere and we don't really have our camera out within the first three or four minutes, yeah, then it's like we're forcing it. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, I've never been really happy with those images when I'm when I'm forced because yep. when you get out of the car and a lot of times we'll both get out of the car, we'll walk somewhere to look at something mm -hmm. and then I'll run back to the car or he'll run back to the car and we know <laughs> we saw something and then the camera's out and we take the picture. And a lot of times if we wait or go back somewhere, we thought the light was really good. Yeah. We end up being disappointed. Yeah. With it, so, yeah. You know, a lot of it is that we're very lucky and, and God's been good to us about yeah. what he's shown us and what we've been allowed to capture. So, yeah. Yeah. Congratulations so far. I can't wait thanks. to see the rest. Oh, yeah. thanks. Thanks. Yeah, there, and there are probably 10 times as many, but we can't keep it out. Yeah, we won't keep going. Uh, more questions? Yeah, you guys started out in serious study of black and white. Yeah, I was wondering, how did that carry over into your color work? Um, pretty well, actually, I think, because um, it seems like, you know, you're seeing shapes and things a lot. You're seeing them black and white so much that when you move to color, there is the color. But I, to me, it kind of like I'm still seeing the shapes and the tonalities in a, to, mm -hmm. to a way, you know, in a, in a way. Um, I mean, sometimes color can be very subtle. You don't want this, you know, great oranges and yellows and all. Something that could be a very subtle mm -hmm. um, tones in that. So I think it helps. I think it's, <clears throat> to me, I've always noticed people that have started in film somewhere, when they go to digital, they seem to have, I don't know, it seems like their pictures to me, and I've seen quite a few, seem like there's something about them that seem a little more refined, maybe a little better overall. And that's, that's not always the case because digital is a great learning tool because it's so quick and immediate. Uh, that's the thing, you know, we shoot film, you have to, okay, I got to wait, you know, a week to like develop that and then another week for it, print it. And but so, I think a lot of it yeah. was color just wasn't available at the time we were shooting the four by five because you had to send it out and be processed and you didn't have the control over it. So yeah. I think that's why we learned on black and white. And, you know, my heart is in black and white. I always, I love black and white. Yeah. I okay. shoot a lot of color. Um, I do have a gallery here and I found a long time ago that people like color images better than black and white images. And so, you know, I, I've shot a lot of, of color images, but I love mm -hmm. the tones that the black and white gives. But I think having having learned in black and white, I think gives us an edge mm -hmm. because, you know, it, it actually, the scene is speaking to you through its tones rather than, you know, shouting at you with its color. Yeah. Um, I think that's a distinction that sometimes is hard to make. Well, and, and black and white really requires the viewer to be more engaged. It's mm -hmm. not, here's all your information here necessarily. You know, you gotta, you have to be more engaged with it. And that's why some people will just poo poo, you know, black and white, like, yeah, not interested at all in it. And so what, you know, that's okay. But um, a lot of it, it requires a lot on the part of the viewer to do interpretation, mm -hmm. not, you know, you're looking more at, like I said, tones and it does simplify the, the image. In a lot of ways. And early on when we were doing the black and white, I was convinced that Triax was the only way to go for the tones and things. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Gary started shooting with digital and we both did digital well, color, color, color. And it was like color film. And he's like, 
but you can do so much more when you have a color negative because now all your filters are there because you have the whole image mm -hmm. and you can do whatever you want. And I'm like, yeah, but there's still something about triax. It's just <laughs> that was beautiful. A joke for a long time. It was our joke for a long time. And and yeah. I'm glad that he pulled me over into yeah. the color because so much more there in the negative if it's a color negative versus just a true yeah. black and white. Yeah, because the black and whites, really, you have to know if you want that sky darker, you have to know you put a, a red filter on it to really darken right. it or a yellow filter. Or if you have foliage that's got yellow and you want it to pop away from the green, you have to put the yellow filter. So you do it in the field, but you're you're locked in at that point. You cannot. You can't go back and change. You can't change. It's it's what it is, and that's what it is. But with color, well, especially with digital now, you can. It's so much easier. You got the color image right to start with, and you can also blend <laughs> parts of it. So it's yeah, it's, it's it's it really does come down a lot of the whole process is controlling everything you can because I guarantee you mistakes are cumulative. And you, if you make a couple, two or three, it's the image is going downhill one way or the other. It's not sharp enough. You didn't, you didn't stabilize <clears> something. <throat> you didn't use the right filter on it or something. So it's all cumulative, and you mm -hmm. want to avoid those as much as possible because because it's out to get you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the photo gremlins. Are yeah, there, the photo gremlins sure. used to call them. That's right. Yeah. They're still there. The dark room gremlins. It, you know, where a piece <laughs> of dust would come, and it wouldn't happen in the foreground, which is really busy, and you'd never see it. No, it yeah. always happens in the sky right in the center of the picture it's yeah. like and it still happens i mean yeah you get a dust spot on your sensor and it's right in the middle it's a lot of, easier to it's, <laughs> it's where a foliage is so it's really hard to correct it so mm -hmm. yeah the photogrammons are out to get you so. i mean back in the day when you had dust on your negative four by five negative oh God. and it was in the sky you literally had to touch the uh negative up make it a little darker yeah. so when you print it then you got the then you got to touch retouch the print so yeah, it's it's a much better place now <laughs> with yeah, digital. It just is. I mean, so, it's fun. Yeah. Anyway, oh, I'm sorry. More questions? We have two more up there. Any other questions for Gary? Yeah, Gary is. How did you find all of those um, old school houses? Well, that be incredible. Yeah. Thank you. That's that goes back to twenty five years or more. Interestingly, and that's a good question. Actually, we. Uh, Actually, I did a lot of research on old maps. We actually stopped at the the Dalles, I think it was. There was a museum there. Somebody was very helpful. They had old maps, which we could buy copies of. And we, I just kind of, actually, you know, he was a big part of that too, searching them. We just, you know, found it by looking at old maps that, that located them. Unfortunately, most of those are probably gone now, I think. Yeah, it's a shame. Maybe. It is. Yeah, well, it's been a, well, quite a few years ago. Back in the 60s, those, there were so many more buildings out there. Um, mm -hmm. Out in Umatilla area, there were so many old houses, but then the military used them for bombing runs and stuff. So, you know, yeah, they're it, all gone. They, a lot of things are gone now, unfortunately. But yeah, no, it was a lot of research. Just kind of um, now today, you can look on Google Maps and just if you're willing to spend the time to just lock on and then just search it, you can get an idea that there's maybe a building there or something. It's not a hundred percent guarantee, but mm -hmm. it's a little easier now. But yeah, it was just pretty much getting maps and just looking doing history searches and finding the names of the schools where they were and um, then a lot of legwork trying to find them. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's the thing when we go out, we decided in very few cases, it's not good to set a, 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 a destination, a destination and what you're going to come back with. It's best to just get a general area to go and just go and have fun, go and have fun and take, what, we like take what you take, what you get as you get. It. And, if, you know, we always come back with some two or three images that are just mm -hmm. worth the trip. Very rarely, you know, we come back with just one or none, but that's pretty rare. So, all right. Okay. So, well, Nick, do you want to do you want to go sure. ahead then and, and yeah, talk about your and, images? Sure. Um, so this is a four by five image. This is one of my favorite images. Um, it's called Old Friends. Uh, it was up at uh, yeah, it's Gary and I, <laughs> but there's actually three stumps there, but two of them, you know, they look kind of like alligator butts, but they're actually old stumps. Um, uh, this is a picture that I took in Germany. Um, this one I actually gave to um, the 9-11 disaster. And there's a book that people have signed sort of their well wishes to New York for the 9-11. For the um, we did it. We had it here in Vancouver. And the book went around and the picture went around. And actually, I gave one of these images to Rudy Giuliani 
I gave one to um, George Bush, um, Governor Locke. Uh, we've got one in our sister city in, in um, Poland. Um, it's basically one sunflower for each of the victims of the 9-11 disaster and then the apple tree. Um, and there's a wheat field in the background. So um, that's one of my uh, favorite images that I took over in Germany at the time. So the, eventually the book and this photograph hopefully will go to the World Trade um, to the museum there, but we just haven't found the right person to, to give it to there. But I do have one at the White House, which was nice. I can tell you about black and white thing. Yeah, this was actually, I took this picture in black and white with my four by five, and there was a, a guy with a tractor that was coming along. This is in Germany. I didn't speak German. And he was coming to mow these sunflowers down, and I hadn't quite got the picture. So I ran out there as fast as I could to try to tell him not to mow the sunflowers down. Well, he just went past. He wasn't planning on doing anything. So I ran back, took the picture. I took several in black and white with different filters. And then I took the camera off and I thought, you know, I probably should take one in color because it's their sunflowers and whatever. So I actually got this one image from there too. Uh, this is a four by five um, Lewis River. Uh, I think that looks like a whale's head. A lot of my images, I see things in them. I don't tell him that because he doesn't like to see things nuts. in them, but it drives him nuts. So I try to point it out every time I see one in his picture, but he yeah, won't look at it. <laughs> um, this one is, um, I, I see a mermaid in that one. I don't know if you can see it I going see up it. to the right. Um, looks like the water flowing across the rocks. Uh, again, this is a four by five um, that's scanned and, <laughs> and printed digitally. Uh, this mm. is... Um, called Dancing Aspens. This is up in, on the way to Yakima. I just like the way those, it has movement to it, which is, mm -hmm. I, I like that. Um, this is up at Mount Rainier. We've been looking for these trees ever <laughs> since we took it um, 25 years ago. We can't remember where they were, but they're huge cedar trees that are up there and the light was just coming through uh, perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, these are some of the uh, four by fives. This one I call Monster rock, it looks like a monster sort of coming out of the water. This is at Mount Rainier. This is in Germany. Um, I just, I love all the old staircases and the history that's over there. Um, again, this is Heidelberg Castle in Germany. Um, this, we took a trip to France and we couldn't get up to where the gargoyles were. So I went across the street to the um, gift shop and that's the ledge of the gift shop and I took one of the gargoyles that was there and stuck it there <laughs> and then got this picture and everybody thinks it's one of the gargoyles on Notre Dame but it, it's actually not it's just a little gift shop so you can do a lot with uh, props if you do it Hasselblad. this is a Hasselblad negative yeah uh, this is in uh, the Alps my son and I went there um, this is up by Mount Rainier this is a film this is uh from a tour bus at, in chicago my wife and i were there and i just the light was just perfect between the wrigley building here and i really love the tones in this photograph um and i don't know that seems like a little scary walkway to go across but <laughs> i'm sure it's safe um this is in eastern oregon um Eastern Washington. And then this one, um, when the comet was here, um, we went out to that schoolhouse that we saw before and um, got this photograph. Gary brought his lights and we put them in the schoolhouse and took this uh, image. That was a wonderful night. It was really warm out. And it's kind of lonely when you're out there in the middle of nowhere and it's pitch black and, yeah, it's you know, <laughs> All you can see are the flashes. You couldn't, I couldn't even see the numbers to set my focus on my ring because it was pretty dark. Um, this was the next night we went out. This is in Eastern Washington also. Oh, sorry, this is Oregon. Uh, this was down at um, the, uh, what's it called? Peter Iredale. And so this is my, so I've kind of gone through the 35, then the four by five, then the digital uh, 35 Canon, which I shot a lot of my images on. 
And now I have a Fuji film, which is a GFX medium format. And it's amazing to me, the sensitivity of that sensor with the, you know, this is a four second exposure. And I actually lit the, I lit the um, Iredale with a little tiny handheld flashlight because I hadn't brought a big one with me. So that's like a four second exposure, but the, the Milky Way is just amazing. There's something about that medium format sensor that really picks up a lot. Well, and, and let me add to this, because I was, I was taking the same shot and there was a couple <laughs> shooting with their two cameras next to me. So it was just the four of us there. Um, and, and what was interesting is I looked on the back of Nick's camera. It looked almost like this. Mine, you couldn't even see the Milky Way. It was just, you know, and yet I had a different exposure that was even brighter. And the other two people who were shooting on Sony 35, they were looking at it and they went, what? What's your f-stop? And he goes, f4. Now, these guys are shooting like f1.4. I'm shooting at like f2 and Nick's at f4. But his sensor is just that much more sensitive. It just brings up all these different details. It's, it is really an amazing family. Just had to say that. <laughs> and this was uh, from my old house. This is Mount Hood. I, was, I just woke up from a nap and looked out and saw that uh, <laughs> image with the mountain. I have lots of pictures of, of Mount Hood because I was lucky enough to have this view from where our old house was. Um, then this was, my wife woke me up and said, you might want to go look at the mountain tonight <laughs> or in the morning. It's like 4.30 in the morning and the crescent moon was just right in a perfect position. So that's not a, that's not a composition. That's an actual, um, just one shot. Did you Fuji? Yeah, this is again from the house. This, this is a sunset of Mount Hood. Uh, this is a sunrise. You can see the, um, shadow on the mountain coming on the clouds there i kind of hated giving up that house because i got lots of pictures of of mount hood mm -hmm. from there um again another one they're so different though they're so different. now this was a friend took me up in his uh plane it looks like i'm in a satellite but this is actually mount saint helens um on the side where the i think the Tootle river starts um but it almost looks like a satellite uh photograph but it, it's the last time i'm going up in the plane because it got air sick so but i got the shot that i wanted so this was the the full image from there this is at cannon beach at hug point um i just like the again i like the way i think this goes back to my black and white i like the the way the light plays on the on the stream that goes through the center of it um you know, it looks like a crystal to me. This was that day at Shore Acres, the, the first time we went, uh, right before the storm kind of pushed us into the car. And then we ended up, uh, I think when I took this picture, Gary got the one with the waterfall because he was hiding it on the other side. The rainbow. He was hiding it on the other side. I didn't see it. <laughs> this is down at, this was right before I took the one at the Peter Iredale. The sunset was beautiful that day um this one was um at heck i think it's yakin i think it's yakin, yakin to head or something the lighthouse yakin. there um i actually was cussing when i took this picture because it was so dark i couldn't tell if my pictures were in focus or not but that it ended up this working out moon, perfect right? yeah it was a full moon um, so we got a lot of a lot of ambient light that, that came in um this one we just took about a month ago, um, yeah. it was really stormy out. And uh, again, I, I just like the leading lines from the, from the uh, yeah. pathway and I like the tones in that. Um, this is the day we were down at uh, Cape Disappointment. That's a beautiful place. It took us a long time to get there, but it's really pretty. Yeah, it <laughs> um, this is a waterfall up in Oregon, in Washington. Washington. So. This one, um, I was in Yosemite <laughs> and um, talk about luck. I was, I drove up here. I'd been there the day before and I wanted to get a picture of the falls. So I went back up to the viewpoint and I'm standing there and I'm taking a picture and there's an old guy and, a, and his son and they've got their tripods out and everything. And I'm just clicking away. And I turn to go back to the car and I hear the son say to his dad, there's the rainbow dad, finally. And I said, rainbow. And I turned around and he goes, you don't know about the rainbow he said it happens for a week every year and 
the it started you could see it at the bottom of the waterfalls blue and then green and then yellow and orange so the light just the rainbow just went up the falls like that and i had no idea and you know those people had probably planned a whole trip to go there <laughs> but i just happened to pull up at the right time that last? Uh, it only lasted like maybe five minutes mm -hmm. and then it was done um, so you have to have all the elements just right there but yosemite is absolutely beautiful this is the other shot Gary, yeah. Gary showed you the picture of the full rainbow, and this is the picture looking down the gorge at the at the two rainbows. Like and we we actually saw the that rainbow just started in the center of the picture there, just as a rainbow square, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden it just blew up into this magnificent double rainbow. Yeah. Um, these are aspens up in Did Washington. No, this this is my digital. Mm -hmm. uh, this is in Hawaii. <laughs> Uh, this is up the gorge. I just really like the subtle lighting on this on this photograph. Um, this is down in Utah. I thought I've never seen aspen trees have done that, so I'm not quite sure what happened to them, but it was it was a fun fun picture to take. More aspens. I love aspen trees. This is again up by my old house. Um, the light again for black and white. It's all about the light. Yeah. and this was our trip down the gorge the last year we were during covid we went out a lot during covid and got a lot of pictures without a lot of people in the pictures which was nice we didn't get arrested that was good <laughs> this is a picture i took with my iphone in downtown portland years ago and and it's amazing to me that uh, you know because i'm shooting a 100 megapixel now camera and this picture was taken with an iphone which is like 12 megapixels and it's i mean i i couldn't have done better with my big camera at that time that bird just happened to fly by at the right time mm -hmm. um but this is in uh utah this is yosemite obviously this is at um this is called the indian chief this is in um the canyons uh, can't remember. Oh, it's a, I don't know. I can't remember the name of the canyons down there, but everybody photographs down there. So it's a cha uh, You can see the Indians' um, head sort of right here, the chief. But that's a beautiful location too. Um, this is something I've been doing for a long time. These are composite images, so I do ghost images. Um, so uh, my cousins were kind enough they weren't there with me i photographed them in a different place and then i cut them out and put them into this photograph so i have a couple series here of, the, of things like that that i did this is down at the canyons again um this is in germany um i love that road and and the crosses on it um, and more at the lone first cemetery um, these are just some of my animal shots. We were driving along, went to the Audubon Society, and this owl was out on somebody's arm. So I got close enough to get a picture of him, and I thought he looked pretty intense. I didn't know if he wanted to eat me or not at this <laughs> point, but that's what he looks like. Um, this one was at the zoo. The orangutan had his head against the window and kind of was looking forlorn at me when I took the picture. So yeah, it was fun. Then this was uh, the flamingo up there at the zoo. Um, a lot of times I look for sort of intimate things in the landscape or in, in what I'm shooting. So it's not quite the whole flamingo. It's just part of it. I mean, I think you can see that that's a flamingo just by the colors and stuff. But I really, it's amazing to me to see all the detail that's in, in, the, in the feathers. Um, this mm. was, I shot at um, Sovies Island. Um, I can't remember the name of the cranes, but um, it almost looks, it looks like it was shot in the Orient just with those, but those are corn stalks, not bamboo. Um, How do you look like bamboo? Don't they? And this picture I was at um, Ridgefield Wildlife and just happened to catch this swallow as he was taking the bug right out of the water. So that's his actual reflection in the water uh, when he grabbed the, you can see the bug that's, uh, in his beak right there but it almost looks like a composite but it's not he was just flying by and they're very fast if you've ever tried to photograph them 
this was at the zoo and I thought rhinos fit together who would have known but <laughs> apparently they're meant to fit together like that so <laughs> they were just happy to play around when I was there and um, I waited and waited and I finally got to the right position and then the one on the uh, left immediately pushed the other one in the water this was um i shot the seahawks game up in seattle so this was actually the seahawks mascot and if you look closely you can see the seahawks emblem in the um stadium in inner eye um so i got some nice pictures of the game too but i can't really do much with those because they're can't copyrighted <laughs> uh that's a composite of the eagle i took up at the at the zoo and the flag <laughs> at the flag at my house um this was down in eugene we just happened to be there they were doing a uh test fire and i just really liked the shadows and the light play that happened with this with this photograph that's another one i kind of hate because i didn't see that <laughs> and he shot it and i love it <laughs> and this was um there's an artist in town um he's a sculptor i i'm forgetting his name right now but mary hill has a lot of his sculptures up there and so i got to go to her studio and um take some pictures of him and this is his hands on one of his on one of his um statues and then um this is one of the actors from the librarians um and he did he did watch us too and he needed some pictures taken of some art that he was doing so when i went over there to see him in his apartment he was working on one of the watches and I asked if I could take a picture and he let me. So again, it, it's all about the light. Um, and that's it. Any questions at all? Boy, those were fabulous. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, any questions for, for Nick or, or for you. Nick and Gary? It's the time to ask. Yeah. <laughs> Shy. Yeah, we talked a lot. I think you're really lucky to um, have uh, somebody whose perspective or their uh, passion for photography is similar to your own. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what your passion is, but finding someone uh, who doesn't mind pulling the car over um, yeah, and staying yeah. 20 minutes, getting back in the car and then going, yep. uh, you know, a, a half a mile and doing it again. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's really true. hard. Right. Uh, I, I say photography is a solitary sport mm -hmm. and it, it, from what I'm hearing your uh, descriptions and, and your images, um, you two are one solitary uh, right. when it comes Thanks. to photography. Yeah. So and congratulations on, on finding that, uh, you know, shared passion. Yeah, we're, we're very lucky and, yeah. you know, our wives would never let us do this. No. Oh, this is being recorded, isn't it? Gary said that. <laughs> whoa, whoa, what? Yeah, but, <laughs> but no, I mean, we've been, we've all been there before. When you go with someone who's not a photographer, and I, I don't understand that they, you know, they don't understand why you want to stop and take this picture of, yeah. you know, these trees. I mean, what do you want this picture of a tree for? I don't yeah. understand this. And then, you know, when you have a tripod and you're setting up for an hour, they, they get kind of, <laughs> you know, antsy and you can feel that. And I think it does kind of, impact your images and so what's really lucky is that we found each other and we can go out and actually play off of each other's emotions and sort of get the photographs that we yeah. want yeah um you know yeah we give each other a bad time a lot of the times but it's usually in jest but, yeah. Um, yeah it is nice and we are very lucky that we can go out and we're lucky that we have wives that let us go out and do that too. And we're also very lucky. But I, we've been, I've been married 43 years and you've been married how many? 37. 37. So. Same woman too, you know, each one of us. Yeah. So we, we did okay. We didn't get any divorce. Going right, on, yeah. So. <laughs> and I think the older we get, the more they want us to go out. They're actually <laughs> putting maps out for us. <laughs> yeah. I think they want us to go out. and read. Oh, shoot. This is being recorded. Is it? Oh, oh, God. We can cut this, right? We're done. We're never going out again. <laughs> But yeah, it is. It is good. Uh, I mean, it's really. It's, if you can connect with somebody with similar likes, that's, you know, it's a good thing. Even if you don't go out, if you're just connecting, you know, in in the digital darkroom realm, so mm -hmm. to speak, it's probably good uh, that you, you know, and you can trust each other for honest opinions and that. You know, it's. It's uh, most artists are. I don't care what art you're looking at. You're talking about actors or singers or whatever. You know, we tend to be a very insecure bunch of people, and um, it, it, when you have someone else there. It, it kind of takes that edge off of it, I think, because mm -hmm. of the insecurity, uh, which is nice. Um, 
And the main thing we've learned, I think, is just to go out and have fun. And if you don't, yeah, you know, it's very rarely that we've gone out and not come back with with images. I think yeah. if you don't have the expectation, at least for us to go out and say, I'm going to make this photograph, because yeah. a lot of times you just happen to be at the right place at the right yeah. time and you can see it yeah. and, and like it yeah. makes it it makes it more fun though and like nick, nick said you know you get out of the car and you're if you're trying to to force the image too much it's just walk away because we find most of the time it's like okay it wasn't quite there it wasn't worth doing mm -hmm. and you just end up deleting it you know or something but so the thing we do share as far as we really like to tell people is boy print your images to me it isn't yeah. It isn't, we, we feel it's not done until it is printed because in this digital age, it's just so, um, I, you know, everything's just so on, on the screen and all that, but the way it needs to be seen is by the artist, the photographer is to print, print, print. It's a tangible thing. It holds more value, intrinsic value to people. And it's just the way it should be seen. So mm -hmm. uh, we're big proponents about printing. Uh, so, yeah. Anyway, thanks. Yeah, if you have more questions, thanks, sir. Any, 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 any one else? One. I, I just have a comment I'd like to make. I, I, with the, it, I'm really interested by the fact that you've used such a huge variety of um, of methods, cameras, mm. film, digital, and yeah. with only a couple of exceptions that you've commented upon, maybe the Milky Way picture. Yeah. It really doesn't matter. You can't tell. You don't know. It's yeah. all these images. You can make a marvelous image with not much. Exactly. Not as much. Yeah, 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 and I think yeah. I think that that's part yeah. being trained in four by five, and we were always going after that quality and things. And I think that's why I threw that iPhone picture in there because a lot of times mm -hmm. I don't have my big camera with me when I go and I see a picture, yeah. Yeah. and I take it with the iPhone. And you can actually do a lot with that. And yeah. it, it it it's about the image and about how you see the image and how. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not so much the equipment. I mean, oh, yeah. the equipment is nice. I mean, you know, you can play a really nice violin or you can play a Stradivarius. I mean, yeah. you know, but the music to most people is going to sound the same. Yeah. Are a few people that see the difference and appreciate that. But, yeah. you know, for the most part, I personally, I, I've looked at Gary's pictures for a long time and he's looked at mine. And even though I shoot with a two and a quarter, I, I don't see that when I look at his pictures. I don't say, oh, that's not a two and a quarter so it's not as you know what i mean yeah. it's that the image captures me and that sort of makes me feel a certain way and that's important you, you want to have fun and yeah. you want to have you know images yeah, sure. that people will <laughs> want to look at and and share with you and yeah. it doesn't really matter whether it's an iphone or a sony or yeah or whatever whatever works for you yeah. really because it's you that's, know that's a very good point yeah and you don't want these the last thing i like to have is have my my equipment be a burden to me oh i've got to carry all these lenses you know I, i'm if I'm going in the field, I got a belt with three lenses and my camera with one lens, mm -hmm. and that's it. I mean, a tripod's in the car if I need it, but it's pretty light setup, you know. Uh, but yeah, boy, don't don't get burdened by, you know, cameras and stuff. If it's working for you, probably don't change, you know, because mm -hmm. people do fine with whatever equipment they got. Uh, it's really what you see. It's the vision of the photographer. Uh, look at what's her name. Um, who's the street photographer gal? Um, Virginia Mayer. Virginia Mayer. I mean, look at her. I think she had basically one camera, you know, and she developed, you know, <laughs> look at her lifestyle. And then just left them in a shoebox somewhere. It's yeah. just amazing to me. And that, she was an incredible. You know. I mean, beautiful tones. She knew how to, you know, just beautiful, beautiful tones and amazing compositions. And she recorded this strip of history for you. And again, you know, simple, simple stuff. Mm -hmm. But so, yeah. Yeah. So anyway. Any yeah. any other questions? Yeah, I have one. Is for both of you. Is like, how do you know when to um to trigger the shutter? And then the uh, follow up on that is how, you know, like, how many outtakes do you have? And are there times when you go back like five years, ten years later, and you see an image and you say, "Holy cow, that's actually a really a nice image." Yeah, good question. <laughs> that's, those are good questions, actually. Um, <clears throat> well, let's see. So you asked about the, what were your first part of the question? The shutter. Oh, the shutter. So I wanted to know. Yeah, that that just comes, I think, from experience. Yeah. It's like if you were a street photographer, it's knowing that moment. And it is that quick with 
landscapes in some cases it's like you gotta especially with anything's moving in the in the scene i'm watching trees you know i got like a half second exposure for the water but i'm watching the trees moving and i'm watching mm -hmm. when they hit a moment of stillness and when the wind's blowing this way and bam that's it so it's a lot of um it just comes from doing it enough i guess mm -hmm. but but um it is surprising how much that step that decisive moment is in in landscape photography i would never have thought that unless i did it enough and good for me, it's sort of, you know, people ask me about, you know, composing and it, it I've been blessed with being able to compose. I, I can't really teach it. Um, it's just something mm -hmm. I see, whether I use a two and a quarter or, or a full frame or whatever, whatever I see through the viewfinder, I compose it the way I want. And um, I think that's important too, to sort of be able to, to compose your picture so it looks nice and nothing's out of place in it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, the picture of the dancing aspens that I took, um, I didn't take it in color. We went back oh, six yeah. years later yeah. and we found the same trees and I took it in color. And it's almost scary that when I put the two <laughs> negatives on top of each yeah. other, the four by fives match up because yeah, crazy. my, you know, and I did that. There's a gravestone at Lone First mm -hmm. Cemetery that is the carved. There's a man and woman there. Um, it's, it's a famous gravestone mm -hmm. that's been there. And I took that in four by five and then went back like 10 years later and took it again when I was some of the ghost pictures. And again, the, the images can almost line up on each other. So there's something about the way I see the image to, mm. to put it together. And then once I see that, I know when to push the shutter. So, um, and, and you, were you asking about, um, uh, going back in our images from, we took four or five years ago and looking at those, is that what you were asking? Yeah, it is like like yeah. um, kind of all related is yeah. like how many outtakes and then if oh, you, yeah. uh, your images uh, given a, you know ten years twenty years later yeah oh, wow. well for me I'm generally finding if it's a really good scene I'm going to shoot four to six on on average you know unless it's a moving well, like there's moving branches there's moving tree parts moving water. Then it's more like 10 to 12, but that's that's pretty rare. I'm shooting ever shooting that much. I'm usually going to shoot three or four and then move position. Mm -hmm. And like I said, that's why I said going back to being able to handhold it with a smaller digital camera over a four by five is you can you can literally crouch down and take like a quarter or even a half second exposure, mm -hmm. you know, with um with you know propping yourself up, but to be able to get an angle you could not get any other way. Yeah. But yeah, no, I don't take a lot of really i don't think nick does either you have somebody just take one or two don't you yeah and yeah. and it depends on the equipment my canon i had to take four yeah. or five or six to get one that was extremely sharp i don't know what that was about yeah, it, was canon. it was some weird thing that they had with it yeah with my new camera I only need to take two or three and i'll i don't know, get it a lot of times i don't i'm sort of a pack rat i don't throw away any of my old images so a lot of times um i'll go back and look through my I have my folders um, with the images of the trips we've taken mm -hmm. and so sometimes I'll just be bored and I'll go back and look through a folder that I'd looked through maybe four or five times before and it's amazing how many times you'll find an image there mm -hmm. that speaks to you which didn't speak to you at yeah. the time that you yeah. look through it so yeah. for me I don't ever throw anything away I just kind of yeah. go back and look through we call it you know we're kind of looking for the gems and, you yeah. know, and, and a agree. lot of times you shift through things and you'll, you'll see a picture and you'll be like, wow, I don't know why I didn't do that picture before. Yeah. I, same um, way with that. Yeah. yeah. So I guess, yeah. I don't know if that answers well, the question, but yeah. I have a lot of images, but I haven't thrown them. I don't throw any away. Well, well thank you both. We have one more speaker tonight, yeah. and, but, oh, but thank you both. Those were wonderful <laughs> speakers. Or, those were wonderful photos, and uh, thanks for sharing your story. Thank you. uh, well, thanks for having us. Really. Yeah, thanks. We appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so our, our, uh, our, our other speaker tonight is Walter Oliver. Walter, are you here? I'm here. Great. Um, well, welcome. And do you want to start your screen share? And uh, I will. Uh, tell us a little bit about your project and your and yourself. Okay, good. We see your uh, Lightroom catalog and your photo. Whoops, what just happened? There we go. Okay. Well, thanks, Gary and 
Nick, that's a tough act to follow. I've got um, a story I want to tell here. So if you don't mind, I'm going to reference my teleprompter during this presentation. With that, and now for something completely different. I'd like to talk to you this evening about a project I've been pursuing for several years and how it developed. We'll talk about how the project started, how it came into focus, and how it was developed over time. I hope you find it interesting. Please feel free to ask questions as we go. It all started on New Year's Day 2011. I went out to Coney Island with some friends to shoot the polar bear plunge. Somehow I managed to bring along all my gear except my DSLR. Luckily, I had pocketed my point and shoot camera, but by the time we got to Coney Island, I had lost interest in photographing the event. Instead, I walked along the boardwalk, taking photos as I went, and happened upon a disused call box with the word, a door scratched into it. I was fascinated by it, but I didn't give it a lot of thought. It sat on my computer, unloved for about six months, when I was invited by friends to take photos in New York City. My companions were determined street shooters looking for subjects for street portraiture, which is not especially an interest of mine. As I considered what I might shoot, I remembered the Adore photo, and I thought, it's New York. There's so much graffiti, there have to be more instances of a door. As I searched, I found lots of re related graffiti to photograph, but I didn't see another example of a door. Here are a few examples of, my, of some of my early targets. At first glance, these images may not look like much, but stick with me. This was early in the project. This started me on a mission and I began seeking out graffiti to shoot all over New York and wherever I traveled. But I wasn't capturing just any graffiti. I soon realized I was photographing graffiti, stencils, or stickers, specifically with emotional content. No tags or murals. I called it relationship graffiti. I mentioned this to friends who then reminded me that I had been experiencing some emotional upheaval in my life. So they were not surprised. Your classic duh moment. This helped me make visual sense of what I was feeling through my photos and gave me focus, so to speak. I became intrigued by the things people said about their relationships and how they voiced their thoughts on what might be considered very private matters in very public spaces, such as walls, utility poles, and even police call boxes but those feelings were stated anonymously. This anonymity suggests to me that the makers have a certain ambivalence about their feelings. Still, these are strong feelings over which the individual has little control. I was excited about the possibilities and I began shooting every chance I got, even though I really didn't know where the project was going. It's been said, that one's art often knows what it's about before the artist knows. I don't recall where I read that, but it sure seemed to be what I was experiencing. Even so, I wasn't yet sure what I was gonna do with the photos. I continued searching, continued shooting, confident that the work would reveal its purpose to me. Eventually, you got the crayon. I was being pulled forward by the work. At some point, I photographed graffiti with a symbol unknown to me, the letter A with a circle through it. After some research, this turned out to be the symbol for anarchy. I was intrigued by this as well, and after some research, 
I titled this work, The Anarchy of Emotion. By way of background, anarchy simply defined is a state of disorder due to the absence or non-recognition of authority. The act of creating graffiti can be considered fundamentally anarchic behavior, I think, but how does that relate to emotion? Emotions can't be legislated or mandated, don't play by any set of rules, and human beings can't really control how they feel. I didn't find it much of a stretch to view emotions as anarchic in nature as well. Over time, however, I felt that anarchy was perhaps too restrictive and that cries from the street was maybe a more expansive umbrella under which diverse emotions expressed in graffiti might be understood. To get a sense of how to present some of these images, I made hundreds of four by six test prints looking initially for best images. As I sorted through the prints, I started to see themes so I went back through the prints that didn't make the initial cut, in other words, my discards, with these themes in mind. I then laid the selected photos out by theme on 13 by 19 sheets, one theme per sheet with one word descriptions. Unfortunately, I didn't have the foresight to photograph the original templates, but here's an example of what they looked like. I had about a dozen of these sheets laid out on the dining room table and I was madly shuffling all these four by six prints around. It was a really interesting process. Within that constraint, I selected the best images to support each theme. The themes covered a range of feelings, among them philosophical considerations of the meaning of life desperate loneliness and longing, apparent hatred, and the search for love. The next problem was how to present, which I found a very difficult problem to address. Then I came across an architectural poster that got me thinking because of the way the photos on the poster were organized in a grid. I experimented with this grid idea until I settled on a graphic, but somewhat less rigid grid with a black background. Bold color and careful spacing helped to emphasize the theme expressed in each panel. I had these printed and mounted on thick 16 by 20 foam core panels, which I first presented in a group show at the Carl and Helen Berger Gallery at Kane University entitled Mill Street Salon Beyond the Image. I was a member of the Mill Street Salon in New Jersey at the time. Is that a motley crew or what? Following are the final panels for the Kane show. This is the first panel, which I called She, partly because I had that image in the upper right and the rest of it was all what seemed to me to be issues related to women. The second one I named a door for obvious reasons. I found a lot of amour, but no ador. The third one I called hateful because they seem to me to be hateful, hateful feelings described by these images, especially the one in the upper left. I don't know if you can read it on Zoom, but I'm gonna go ahead and read what was typed out there. I know that you're here, Carol, eight and a half years since our psychic separation, but I've come to collect. Consider yourself warned with love, rabbit. It was incredibly creepy. If you look in the lower center, you can see that it was written out probably with a Sharpie on a girder in a subway station in Brooklyn. 
this one I called ambivalent because the feelings described seemed unclear. They may have been clearer at some point, but it looks like at least in a couple of cases, somebody erased somehow or tore off the actual sentiment. But the feeling it left me with was ambivalence. This one I call lonely. This one I call plaintive because it struck me as almost begging in a way. And, you know, please love me was the impression that I got. Imagine the work somebody went through to paint that love me on the side of that building in the upper left. This one I called de declaration because it was a straightforward statement on love. For example, the one in the middle, I love you, Caroline. And this one, again, for obvious reasons, I called heart. One thing to mention here, parenthetically, these images were taken in various locations, not only New York, in different parts of this country, and some of these are actually shot in Provence. The feelings communicated are pretty similar, no matter where the people writing the, sim the exhibiting the feelings live. That was one thing that struck me anyway. As I was looking to follow up on this gallery show, I was invited to participate in a workshop based on the book, The Courage to Create by Rollo May. This workshop gave me the inspiration to present the work in a slightly new way. Because I found the photo so full of emotional content, I wanted to capture how photos, how the photos made other people feel. I placed sticky notepads beside each panel and asked people to write a few words about their reaction to the photos. There was a great turnout for the show, but I didn't find it very successful in terms of the feedback that I got. Eventually, I created other presentation forms, including a 3D collage. and a handmade book. The book became a way to tell a new story with a somewhat new narrative based on individual photos as opposed to the theme panels. This was my summary of the book on the first page. Just in case it's unclear on Zoom, I'm gonna go ahead and read it if you don't mind. During a challenging time in my life, I found myself drawn to photograph what I loosely refer to as relationship graffiti. I became intrigued by the things people said about their relationships and how they voiced their thoughts on normally private matters in public spaces such as walls, utility poles, and even police call boxes, but did so anonymously. Love is an emotion we're all capable of, yet some haven't experienced it in a lasting way, and some not at all. Cries from the Street, A Pursuit of Love, is about the desire to be loved and the struggle to find love. The images presented here map a theoretical path from a philosophical consideration of the meaning of life to desperate loneliness and longing, followed by a search for love, and finally the connection to love represented by a progression of relationship graffiti photographs. These are the photos in the book.
This one says face life if that's not readable. I'm also planning a new book with an expanded narrative. As you can see, the project has evolved over time. And as I add new photos, see new connections between the feelings expressed in the photos, and indeed how my life changes over time, I expect the project will continue to evolve. Lastly, I never have seen another instance of a door. Anybody have any questions? You think maybe Adore mm -hmm. is someone's name like Adore? Your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was really uh, interesting how when you put them uh, on the on the sheets, uh, it, like the panels, how each one was really interesting in its own in its own right, kind of as a a super composition. Yeah, I struggled initially to to. Um find a way of presenting individual photos. I didn't I didn't feel that I had enough of, of them that were strong enough to stand alone. Some really stand out, but in general, I didn't think I could put up, you know, 15 individual photos and, and have as strong a presentation. The theme idea really resonated with me. Well, I... I absolutely love what you have found in graffiti. I think it's extremely unique and, and maybe because I was a psychologist, huh. it appeals to me tremendously. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. I, I, I always find, um, I photograph graffiti a lot as, as well. And I always find it uh, a as a language. And, you know, I'll post something and somebody in my family will say, why are you photographing that, you know, ugly graffiti and they're, they're ruining the wall or, or whatever. But I always find that it's a, that it's a, that it's a language not much different than, than the spoken word or music or, or any other kind of art form. And um, I really uh, am excited that you brought the language of love to, um, to us by way of graffiti and, um, and, and emotional love. It's really very terrific. Thank you, Walter. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Walter, I love the, your presentation so much. Uh, very creative. Um, I'm particularly uh, you know, moved by how the work uh, itself you know, drove the the series you didn't sit around and think okay i'm gonna take pictures of graffiti because that would be really cool but you took a few pictures and you it you know that idea evolved from the process itself 
it seems like uh, just putting one foot in front of the other and, and following, uh, you know, each idea as it sort of generated another. So uh, that's a feeling I get from, from this body of work. And, you know, it's just that organic quality uh, is just, you know, resulted in such an effective series. No, thanks, Pat. Yeah, that's exactly what happened at first. I wasn't sure what was going on. I was out there with friends and it was a bit of a lark, but then I realized I had something going on. And with time, the work just pulled me along. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Thank you. Walter, I really appreciate uh, like the continuity of, uh, of this work and it's a chance to look at uh, a, a communication that, uh, as someone mentioned, we don't often uh, uh, look at. So I was wondering, how long have you worked on this project? When, you know, how long ago did you start? I started in, well, it was January of 2011. The polar bear swim at uh, Coney Island. Mm -hmm. That's what I consider the official start date. <laughs> That's the day you shot a door. That's the day I shot a door. And good thing you uh, forgot your essential equipment because you might have just spent the day shooting those polar bears. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I was... I was um... Rounding up my stuff, I had it all in a essentially in a pile and i was expecting people to come by the house at uh whatever time nine o'clock so we could all get in my car and and head to new york but somebody came in a little bit early and that was just enough of a distraction to get me off my game mm -hmm. it's so funny that i packed everything except the camera <laughs> no accidents huh <laughs> So Walter, what, uh, you know, like, are you done or is there another step? I think there's, I think there's more, there are more possibilities. The project is kind of on hiatus at the moment. I, I've had a kind of a back injury for several months, so I haven't really been out shooting and I haven't really found my way around Portland yet. It's not like I was able to get around New York City. So I haven't really found much in the way of uh, relationship graffiti since we've been in Portland. Although the image that's on the screen that ended the book, that's a Portland image. But I'm open to um, new things. We'll see what happens. Any other questions for Walter? One one last quick one. So, like, uh, how much uh, Portland uh, graffiti have you photographed? And if you have enough to tell, is there a language difference, or is there a psychic difference, or is there <laughs> an emotional difference between New York and you know, like the East Coast and the Portland uh, images? <laughs> I'm not finding that to be the case so far. I've taken pictures in. Cal in different towns in California, Chicago, Oregon, New Jersey, New York, multiple towns in Provence, and I don't see any real difference. So people we're all people. People are fundamentally people, I guess. Any other questions or comments? Well, Walter, thanks so much for, for presenting this. This was really fascinating. I think really creative and, and nicely done. Thank you. Um, well, uh, thanks everyone for coming tonight and uh, we will sign off and everyone have a good rest of the month. Thanks guys for the beautiful show. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for watching.
Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.